Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webinar on strategies for effective grant making. As some of you may know, the PAL Initiative is the region's only non-profit business-led organisation founded to promote a corporate culture of accountability and transparency as a key driver of competitiveness across the Gulf region's private sector. In light of the recent public health pandemic, our knowledge sharing events, including our seminars, workshops and roundtables, have been shifted towards to virtual webcasts. You can find out more about our upcoming webinars on our website, and you can also view our webinars on demand after they've taken place on our website or YouTube page. Um, we have built quite a substantial library um, over the past couple of months, so I do urge you to have a look there. Um, there's a wide range of broad topics and discussion points, um, which I hope you find useful. Um, today's webinar is held as part of our Governance and Philanthropy Programme, which was developed in 2017 to build standards and best practices for giving across the Gulf region. The scope of the programme has grown year on year, and today we are focused on supporting corporate and institutional donors striving to be more strategic and, imp and impactful in their giving. Without further, further ado, I would like to introduce you to our subject matter expert, Neo Valentino, who will be sharing her insights on the strategies for effective grant making. Neo Valentino is a development professional with wide reaching experience across the private, public, non profit, and philanthropic sectors. Neo specializes in macro and micro level strategic planning, impact evaluation, and program design. Neo began her career in corporate strategy and global operations for multinational firms before finding her calling in global development. Although her focus has shifted towards tackling development challenges, Neo still values her commercial experience to structure the concentrated and efficient approach that defines her work. Having most recently served as a director of strategy for one of MENA's region, MENA region's largest privately endowed foundations, Nail was, was responsible for full, full life cycle strategy development, organizational planning, program evaluation, and communications. Nail has also managed special projects focusing on improving the philanthropic ecosystem in the Arab world. As with all our webinars, I would like to just take the opportunity to mention that we do like to keep them as interactive as possible. Um, so, Obviously, it's different from having a face-to-face -face exposure and in-person contact, but we're trying to make it um, as much of a simulation experience as possible to real-life events. So there is a, a channel for you to communicate questions through to Neo. Um, Neo will be fed those throughout the presentation, and she'll try and address those um, throughout the um, presentation or towards the end. Uh, so please do file those through and um, make the most of it. Neo? Thank you once again for all of your support on our Governance and Philanthropy program and for taking time from your busy schedule to do this webinar for us. I know um, the participants will find it extremely useful and valuable in their work. Handing over to you. Thanks so much, Yasmin, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. I know um, we have a little bit of a webinar fatigue. Um, so thank you for joining and um, special thanks to the Pearl Initiative for continuing to host such a rich set of learning events. Um, if the audio, I know we've got one question coming in, uh, someone's audio is not so great. If anybody else has any problems, please do just kind of ping us and let us know. Um, we wanted to take some time particularly now to discuss effective grant making. Today, corporate givers find themselves straddling two worlds, serving the needs during this immediate COVID-19 disaster, while at the same time staying focused on a vision for what we want the world to look like after this pandemic. Wherever you choose to put your money, one thing remains the same, is that you need to get the most bang for your buck. And hopefully today offers something to either help confirm your direction or to improve your existing practices. So just wanted to make a few quick notes about myself. Thank you, Yasmin, for the introduction. Um, and I just want you to understand my background so that you have a, an idea of what my point of reference is and you can guide your questions appropriately. Uh, as Yasmin said, I'm a development professional. I've got 16 years of experience in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. But most importantly, I've been a grant maker, I've been a grant receiver, and I've been a beneficiary. So I've worked on program design, I've worked on implementation, and I've worked with large budgets and small budgets. So while it looks like I've been on many different sides of this ecosystem, the common thread to my experience has always been to bring resources and ambition together to create lasting results. 
And I've been quite lucky in my career and my work in the Gulf because it's offered plenty of ambition and resources to do just that. So over the course of our discussion, if many of you are coming from corporate giving backgrounds, it may seem as though I'm advocating a bit heavily on the side of community organizations. I just want to reiterate that I've been on both sides of the table, and what I'm offering today is just what's bubbled up to the surface as some best practices. So um, today we'll spend some time during our discussion uh, to discuss how to make the most of your philanthropic dollars and avoid common pitfalls. We'll cover why effective philanthropy is important. We'll have a short discussion on the differences between sponsorships and grants. And then we'll dive into the six principles and the related best practices for your pre and post award phases of grant making. I apologize that my slides look a bit wordy, uh, but I wanted them to be a reference for you for after if you choose to go back to them. I know Pearl Initiative records these sessions, so in case it's helpful for you. So I've, I've chosen to forgo the schnazzy slides for something a bit more um, robust. And as Yasmin said, we want to make this interactive and the more interactive we can make it, the better it is for everyone. So to help me get a better idea of who's in the audience so I can best tailor the, the, the discussion, let's do a quick poll uh, and learn about the kind of organizations you represent. So bear with me. Well, I launched this first poll. All right. So if you can just tune in here and let me know what kind of organization you represent. I'll give you a couple seconds to get that in. Ooh, excellent. Thank you. All right, so we're at about 70%. You might want to take the last couple seconds, get your vote in. Okay. Corporate offices. Looks like the majority of us are from corporate offices and then foundations, and that might actually be corporate foundations as well, uh, individuals and family offices. Okay, great. That is very helpful. Thank you. So let's jump in and gain some context on what we're trying to get to the bottom of. Let's examine why squeezing every possible bit of impact out of philanthropy is important. Resources are more constrained than ever, and the needs keep growing, especially now. So we effectively have to do more with what we have on hand. And in the case of COVID-19, as many offices are kind of um, repurposing their philanthropic dollars, we really do have to do more with less. So the UN estimates that achieving the 17 SDGs will cost $7 trillion annually. And a good portion of that is financed by public sector and wealthy countries. But in lesser developed nations, governments are projecting a funding gap of $2.5 trillion. The immediate next port of call to fill those funding gaps is the private sector, and then foundations, and then ultra high net worth individuals, and so on. But when we look at the giving of the Fortune 500 firms, we find an annual giving amount pegged at about $20 billion, leaving a sizable shortfall. So now, of course, there are plenty of other types of gifts, but they're a bit harder to quantify and follow, especially anonymous gifts. So we just kind of use this as a proxy to showcase the shortfall. Now, corporate giving is absolutely a major player in closing these gaps. If we turn our attention to the current situation and the pandemic and use that as foreshadowing for the future, we find that corporate giving is really stepping up to the plate, suggesting that if we just focus some more effort on driving effectiveness, we can close these gaps even further without adding more resources. With respect to the pandemic, The Economist magazine recently published some numbers pulled together by Candid, which is formerly um, the Foundation Center. 
And that attributes $5.3 billion to giving done by businesses by way of grants to over 1,200 organizations around the world. These were either done through structured giving programs that already existed or ad hoc new gifts. And what we know is that many of these companies have started giving outside their traditional niches. They're supplementing public health care gaps. They're buying masks and PPE for hospitals and citizens. They're forgiving debts and rents and things like that. So corporates have been agile and have made departures from their giving strategies to rise to this occasion. And that's a really good sign in solidifying corporate giving seat at the table. So now what's next is to focus on driving impact. So I wanna flip now to another quick poll and take a minute to talk about discussions internally. In your organization, is increasing the impact of your giving discussed on a regular basis? And by regular basis, I mean more than just a passing remark. Um, do you, several times a year, discuss getting more social returns out of your philanthropic dollars? So I'm just gonna launch this poll and let me know if this is something that's regularly on your agenda. Okay, we'll give it a couple more seconds. Let's get a few more votes in. Okay. So, 6436, that's pretty good. That is, um, that's good, that's really, that's really strong and um, gives me a, a lot of optimism. Great, thanks everybody. So let's talk briefly about the differences between sponsorships and grants. While we'll focus on grants during this webinar, sponsorships are equally important. They just tend to be a bit more straightforward. So it's a good idea to differentiate between the two so no one inadvertently applies this information to sponsorship and then makes them a bit more complicated than they had hoped. Um, so the litmus test here is whether or not the recipient of your gift has a high degree of freedom to use those resources. So if they do, then your giving is likely a sponsorship where the recipient can decide how and when to use the gift. But if your gift is governed by a scope, by a budget, by targets, then it's more closely aligned to grants. Grants tend to dictate how the money's used and require some reporting, et cetera. So going forward, we'll focus on grants. Now we tend to assume that a majority of giving in the GCC is delivered via sponsorships. So let's see if that resonates with the group. And uh, if you could just tell me if a majority of your giving, a majority, let's say a majority of your giving is given through sponsorships, grants, or 50-50. All right, we'll give it a couple more seconds. Okay. All right, that's exactly what I would have expected. Um, the GCC really is quite heavy on sponsorships, and that's, that's great. Actually, now, during the COVID pandemic, it's sponsorships that are keeping the lights on for civil society and community organizations. It's, it's the ability to move those dollars around and get them out the door in a very fast and efficient way that's, that's been really important. Um, so while sponsorships maybe in the West tend to get, I don't wanna say a bad rap, but they're, they're seen to be the easier way to give money, it's been so important and, and really particularly during this crisis. Okay, 
Um, now we'll jump into the heart of the discussion, the principles to improve your pre and post award grant making. Now I've split the discussion up along the pre and post lines just to make it more manageable. Pre award is everything you do to prepare to make a grant and post award is everything you do in the implementation phase. So as you start your grant making process, it's important to remember that you're choosing to give a grant to another organization to help you achieve your goals. Now these are your goals that you're achieving with the help of a partner. You're working with someone else because you recognize that they've got a deeper expertise and the right capacities, more so than your own organization does, to achieve those goals. And this does not mean that you've got nothing to add. You absolutely have plenty to add, and you should. But what's important here is that you don't become overly prescriptive or treat the situation as you would your usual tendering process for goods and services. You're making a grant to a partner, not contracting services from a vendor. And that's just a really important notion. Often as corporate givers, we tend to leverage what we do best. Uh, and that has some place here. Obviously, successful businesses, they've got a lot of experience. But that experience doesn't always apply 100%. And let's talk a little bit more about that. In the pre-award phase, the principles I'm offering are, in the preparation stage, to clarify and stick to your goals. In the solicitation stage, do not confuse grant making with contract tendering. And in the negotiation stage, approach applicants as co-investors and not as vendors. And now we can get into each in more detail. So in the preparation stage, you're trying to pull together a pool of potential grantees. Um, often in this phase, I would scour the community and find out who's involved and talk to my contacts and expand my network and have a lot of conversations. But how many of you have started talking to potential grantees only to have your objectives shift and morph along the way? Well, that's pretty normal, especially if you're working in areas where you don't have if you're giving money in areas where you don't have a lot of experience, especially now in the, the COVID pandemic, not every corporate giver has experience in, in public health and infectious diseases. So as you talk to those potential grantees, your conversations keep changing. But how does your pool of candidates respond when you communicate those changes? Were they anxious? But did they still answer yes to all of your inquiries, even though you know it's outside their area of expertise? So clarifying and sticking to your goals is so important because it, help, it helps you avoid something called scope creep. Now scope creep is when your objectives change, and usually if you're an ambitious giver, your objectives are usually growing. So the more the change, the less likely you are to meet your objectives on time and on budget with that pool of potential grantees. And what's worse, the less likely you are to have a pool of grantees that are experts in that field. So you're working with non-experts, so to speak. So to give you an example, maybe you set out to build low-income housing in the community. And somewhere along the lines, you find out that there are learning outcomes are very low amongst children in that same community. So you go back to your group of candidates and ask them to add in an extracurricular program to your scope. But none of these organizations are actually experts in education. They're probably um, housing experts uh, or poverty experts. So they'll try to please you by saying yes, but they might not do a very good job or they might not do the best job by offering learning programs. So if your objectives evolve in the middle of your discussions, it's probably best to host a new or an additional call for proposals after you build that relevant pool of candidates. And if you're absolutely restricted to your current call, say you're short on time or something like that, or maybe just your procurement staff is really stretched, um, you should really encourage those existing candidates to engage in partnerships to help carry out that scope in order to get the best outcomes. 
and this is this happens all the time it's very frequent um so it's nothing to be ashamed of in fact it's probably it's a it's a noble thing to grow your objectives, but what's more noble is to handle it in the right way and be responsible towards those potential grantees. Now the next principle is very relevant to the corporate givers or corporate foundations in the room that tap their existing business back office operations to carry out philanthropy. What I'm about to talk about may help you in your own internal discussions with those departments if they insist on approaching business and philanthropy in the same way. So the solicitation phase is when you release your scope, draw up your scope, or release it to the pool of potential grantees. Now here's a really important notion, and that's the notion that social returns and the ways that you achieve them are much, much different than creating shareholder earnings. Corporate giving has wildly different objectives compared to for-profit activities. So it only makes sense that you'd approach the solicitation phase much differently than you would in business. Now, I'd like to go back to the guiding principle that I had on that salmon colored slide, that you've chosen to work with a grantee partner because you know they're more experienced than you in these areas. That means the way you write your solicitation documents should be open and flexible to encourage them to come to you with their best solutions. If you do that, you'll be pleasantly surprised at how often a prospective grantee offers you something that you hadn't thought of yet. Today, we're always asking grantees to be innovative, to come up with something new, and they just can't do that if you've written a scope so tightly. And the traditional corporate solicitation process is fraught with hurdles and burdens that vendors, like contract vendors, need to jump through in order to prove that they can supply your business. But if you saddle nonprofits or community organizations with those same hurdles in philanthropy, you'll quickly be left with a very shallow pool of prospective grantees. And that's not because they don't know how to respond, but simply because they don't have the resources. Nonprofits do not have full-time business development staff. Off, more often than not, they don't, unless they're quite a large organization. They craft proposals as an add-on to their staff's already full job descriptions. So if you're requiring performance bonds or you're asking for hard copy color bound proposals printed in triplicate and couriered internationally, that's a big hurdle for organizations that have very thin budgets. If you're asking for past performance portfolios or references from clients over the last 10 years, that's really, really burdensome. So best practices here are to ensure that you're asking for only what you're going to use in the evaluation process to evaluate those proposals. You might even consider subsidizing the proposal process to help defray the cost to smaller grantees who don't have full-time staff to write these proposals. And one important thing is to create a level playing field by offering a rubric or answering questions throughout the process. Contract tendering, when you're working with vendors in business, tends to be a very secretive process so that you get the best value. But grant making shouldn't be that secretive. If an organization knows how they're being scored, they'll feel more confident to invest their very scarce resources and time, especially if they often lose out to some of the bigger players or the bigger charities or nonprofits that seem to win a lot of grants. So let's take a pause here. And I wanna, I'm actually really interested in this information. So if you could all, jump in and respond to this, that'd be great. I'd like to hear from you about whether or not you've ever been disappointed, and I'm gonna change this a little bit, with the number or the quality of proposals you receive. Now, number or quality. 
Um, you might have gone into a solicitation process thinking that many organizations would respond with really robust proposals, but you were left with really lackluster responses, very generic, or maybe just kind of responses from the big players. So let me launch this poll and see if you've ever been disappointed. Again, quantity and quality. Give it some more time. Yeah. Okay. Great. So this is a this is the number right here. So 91% of you have been disappointed at some point in time with the quantity and quality of those proposals. And, and that's really a two-way street. And hopefully some of these tips that I'm offering will help you get exactly what you want out of those community organizations by maybe just giving them the confidence that they've got a real kind of healthy shot at winning your grant. Because a lot of times they have to make some really tough choices with their resources. So if they know how you're gonna score them and that you're actually advocating to hear from them, then that would be make all the difference. Great, thank you so much for offering that information. So as you start to negotiate with your shortlisted candidates, it's important to remember that you're not trying to maximize financial value, but you're trying to optimize for social returns. The more you squeeze a grantee, the less able they are to go that extra mile for you, and that detracts from the results. Now, it may cost you less, but you may receive less, and then what's the point? So maybe you've been tempted to restrict the amount of the grant that can be used towards organizational costs, or maybe you've capped funding for a very short trial period. So it's worth thinking about your grant as an investment. Would you starve a private investment of the necessary cash it needs to thrive on the outset? It's kind of like blowing out a flame or starving a flame of oxygen immediately. Would you demand results in an incredibly short amount of time before your efforts could blossom? You probably wouldn't, and you shouldn't do the same to corporate giving. In fact, if it was a private investment, you'd probably jump in there, roll up your sleeves, and do what it takes to make sure that that kind of investment gets traction. So for your giving, you might consider multi-year funding. Nonprofits spend an incredible amount of time fundraising. In fact, they, said they spend 365 days a year fundraising. And that only detracts from program delivery and innovation. So try to offer a steady source of funding that goes beyond a single year. And, and that doesn't mean just say free money year over year, but offer them an option to earn that funding so they know, um, they know where their next kind of paycheck is coming from. Um, you might also consider flexible funding that can be used across the organization to improve kind of their solutions, their processes, their capacities. Community organizations are in a constant cycle of famine. So they rarely get a chance to invest in themselves if all their grant funding is restricted to programmatic line items. And now a recent study of nonprofits revealed that thought leadership, accounting and financial management, even leadership development were some of the key capacities that they wanted to improve or access. And these are areas that are primed for you as a giver, and particularly as a corporate giver, a successful business, to offer as pro bono or non-financial support in addition to your grant. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. And, and timing really is everything. If you think about some of the programs that you're giving, maybe some of you are giving um, towards oh, vaccinations or something in COVID-19, that's a long game. That's not a short game. So, so giving for very short time periods makes it really hard to deliver lasting results, especially if you're giving in kind of human development areas or innovation like education or healthcare and things like that. So let's move on to a quick poll and see how many of you are offering multi-year funding. 
I suspect many of you are. So, okay. Let's see. Try to get your votes in. This is actually really good information for everybody. Wonderful. Good. Now, this is really good news. All right, over 60%. So over 60% of you are offering multi-year funding. That is wonderful. Um, how about discretionary spending? Are you allowing your uh, grantees to have discretionary spending? Um, the poll's open, so feel free to vote. I'd say about 10% seems to be average. But there is a big campaign right now among some of the larger institutional givers to move to 15% and beyond because we're expecting nonprofits and community organizations. I'll try to get your votes and I'm going to close the poll soon. But there, these community organizations, we're expecting so much of them. Think about COVID-19 and, and how much they're doing to support the community. Um, meals to, to children, unemployment insurance, and things like that. They're doing so much, and we're expecting so much of them, but yet we're saying only 10% of your, your funding can go towards that innovation and that drive. So there's a real disconnect there, and we need to think about that as funders. Um, and it's good to know that over 60% of you are offering some discretionary spending, but we need to think a bit more about how much. And then the last poll is about pro bono support. And now this poll is open. How many of you are offering pro bono or in-kind support? And I hope that's a lot because the business community is so well positioned to offer more than just money. And as I said before, organizations, they, they, they need money, of course, but they also need to build their capacities. And I'm going to talk more about that. Let's get a couple more votes in, but I suspect this will be very similar to the previous outcomes. Right, good, excellent. Very responsible giving community. Now that's really good to hear that over 60% of the audience is offering pro bono and in-kind support. Good, so let's move on. And let's talk about the post-award phase and the activities that occur when you make that grant and implementation begins. Um, in these activities, you as a grant maker recognize that you are not on the front lines and you are relying on a partner to deliver. And that's a pretty important notion. Um, so I suggest that you become a very good listener during these implementation stages and that you prioritize what your grantee has to say. Now that doesn't mean that you don't practice good governance um, and you just allow money to be spent however it's spent. It just means that you have to have healthy two-way communication and a very open mind. So for the post-award phase, the principles that I'm offering here in the award stage is that a little due diligence goes a very long way. And in the implementation and monitoring stage, that you should monitor and measure to track learning and improvement, not merely to track compliance. And in the exit and reinvesting stage, encourage sustainable results that outlive your grant. And we'll get into each one of these in more detail. So in the award stage, it's helpful to do a little diligence on your intended recipient. And it's actually less for your sake and more for your responsibility towards that grantee. You should know how much your grant affects their finances. You should know if they're planning to make big structural changes in order to service your grant. And you need to be reasonably assured of their success. Community organizations cast a wide net for grants. And they genuinely want to put together that brand new cutting edge program to meet your needs. And they do want to grow their staff, but it's up to you to make that judgment call as to whether or not you think it's prudent for them to do that or that they're well placed to do it at all. 
See, even today in the pandemic, it's causing you as grant makers to shift or halt your gifts in order to maybe prioritize your own payroll or to support the community for kind of disaster relief efforts. So that happens all the time and it's a risk that needs to be mitigated. If you pull out early for whatever reason, would the organization, would the grantee organization be in very bad shape if you do that? So asking the grantee to help you understand their financial situation and operating structure is, is very much doable and it's key towards you being a responsible grant maker. Um, and this will really also help you avoid staying in a situation that you might not want to be in, in case the grantee organization faces a closure due to you pulling out. Imagine that you want to end a grant due to non-performance. Maybe the organization just is a bad fit or they're not offering the outcomes that you had hoped for and you want to pull your grant funding. But if that grantee turns around and comes to you and says that they'll need to lay off 75% of their staff because of the loss of your grant, that puts you in a really poor situation and it's something that you want to avoid. So doing a little due diligence up front really kind of helps you circumvent that whole pitfall. Now monitoring is one of my favorite areas. You can probably tell I've got a lot on this slide. Um, but while monitoring and evaluation is technically a process that begins early, you actually start monitoring for results after implementation begins. Uh, here, you want to be sure that you're monitoring for the right reasons. You want to monitor to track learning and to create opportunities to improve, not merely to be a policeman or a watchdog. Because compliance is important, but if you're driving the behavior of just ticking boxes or behavior of just submitting a report, then your grantee will be incentivized to be short-sighted. They won't flag risks. Um, they won't really include you in the conversations or look for opportunities to improve. They'll, they'll be focused on submitting that report and, and what you asked for. So reporting is important, but it should be used to identify areas where things can be made better. If you stop short at just reporting, then the process doesn't yield really great results. And to do monitoring and evaluation effectively, you must ensure that it's adequately resourced, that it started early, and it's viewed as a learning exercise. So firstly, you should co-design those targets and ensure they're reasonably measured. Co-designing ensures a shared sense of commitment. Agreeing on the frequency of measurement means you're both, you both fully understand and accept how much time and effort your grantee is committing to the process. If it's too burdensome, then this is the opportunity to address that. If you're asking for reports on a daily or weekly basis, um, then this kind of helps you understand how much time, money, and effort your grantee has to dedicate to do that. Um, and then it helps you guys think about solutions together about how you might tackle that. If you're m and &E is very ambitious and you have big aspirations for your monitoring, then you might consider funding that entire process. And that, that could mean uh, funding a part-time or full-time staff, funding a study, or maybe giving some software licenses so that data can be collected as a priority and not a second thought. Uh, collecting data is very tough and very time consuming and sometimes just a license to Salesforce or something is really um, is really helpful. Um, you should also encourage your grantee to flag risks early so they can be accommodated openly. If your grantee is afraid to tell you bad news, then they can't access your resources to help them get the program back on track. And I can't stress this enough, but share what you learn. Uh, the good, the bad, and share the ugly because it's so helpful to your peers to benefit from your hindsight. And what's more, publishing reports can help attract supplemental funding. So when the time comes for you to pull out of the grant, then there's somebody waiting in the wings to, to fill that gap that you're going to leave. And finally, kind of consider site visits. 
Site visits are a great, easy way to understand where your sources and your resources are going. If you can't do full-scale m and just site visits are a great place to start, and it's a great way for your, um, your leadership to understand a little bit more about what you're trying to do. Uh, now, this will be our last poll um, about m and &E. So I'd love to know if you commission or publish evaluations. Um, yeah, get your answers in now. Because the GCC, everybody says the GCC suffers from lack of information and data, on, specifically on philanthropic projects. So I'm really interested to know how many of you have commissioned um, or even published these. Let's get a few more votes in. Okay, 50-50. That's higher than I thought it would be, so kudos to you for actually um, attending to that M&E um, very specifically. And now my last question is, how often do your grantees flag risks? Grantees don't tend to want to share bad news, but if you've created kind of an environment where they can share the good news and the bad news, and you can tackle those things together, they'll mo be more likely to do that. Ooh, you see I made the cardinal mistake in survey and data collection by offering a middle of the road solution, which is that sometimes. <laughs> okay. So sometimes. <laughs> Grantees sometimes flag risks. Okay, well, that's to be expected. Uh, it's I'm really happy to hear that only 5% of your grantees never flag risks because that's um, missing out on a lot of opportunities to um, look for improvements. Okay, so my last principle, and thanks everybody for staying tuned, uh, is to encourage sustainable results that outlive your grant. To be honest, nothing lasts forever, nor will your grant. But the worst case scenario is that the results you've achieved through your grant do not have any longevity. Usually that longevity is achieved when your grantee, the implementer, builds up its capacity to carry on that work as business as usual. That's when you know you can walk away uh, and things will carry on. Um, or maybe they can fundraise for that concept. You've built something that you're really proud of. So maybe another su success is that they can fundraise amongst new philanthropists because you've built something that is really attractive to others. Um, so that's where you know you've been successful. But to build that capacity, and this is something that a lot of people don't think about, you need to anticipate what your grantee needs. Community organizations rarely expect you to offer anything beyond what's needed for them to deliver on your grant. So try to be proactive in supporting growth for the staff and for their processes. An easy way to do this is to invite your grantee to your own learning activities or to offer learning directly to them. I've said this before, but it's really important here. Bringing them in for your professional development days or to your corporate learning events is so doable. Um, or having your staff go out and host volunteer sessions is completely possible. You can also introduce those organizations to other potential funders because you know who they are. You're in these networks where people of, of grant makers uh, and you know who they are and you can suggest that. And when it comes time to either reinvest or exit, Try to be very transparent and clear about your intentions so that you can offer them plenty of time um, to kind of sort themselves out before you're moving on. So that's really important. Um, I'd like to look in at some of these questions. Um, let's see. Let's see what people are asking. Yep, I don't think there's any questions. Hold on. 
Okay, great. So we're at the end of our discussion and some key takeaways. And as I go over these, try to submit some questions if you have any at this time. Um, but the main idea here is that social returns and the means to achieve them are different to for-profit activities. And so you guys know that, but you wanna make sure that your back offices know that because you cannot approach business and philanthropy in the same way. There's a lot of synergies, but they're not the same. And it's important to remember that you've elected to work with a grant maker because you recognize that they bring something to the table that you do not. So there has to be some amount of trust between the two of you that you've selected them and they're gonna do something for you to achieve your goals. And partnering for success means having a two-way street. So you're, you're doing everything you can do to remove those burdens from your grantee so they can do a really good job for you. And finally, funders should listen closely to grantees, not be overly prescriptive and create an environment where grantees can come to them come to you and um, flag risks, talk about opportunities uh, to change and improve and things like that. So that's all I have for you. I'm gonna check the um, questions one more time, but I don't see anything submitted. I don't see anything submitted. Um, so I'll just give you my information. You can contact me directly. This is my direct email address. Uh, feel free to let me know if you've got any questions. If you need any help with your grant making process, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I'm here for you anytime. So thank you so much for joining Ramadan Mubarak to those who are observing the holy month. I hope everybody stays well. And um, I'll leave it to the Pearl Initiative team to uh, wrap this up and end the webinar. So thank you.